Plenary speaker, please welcome Greg Jay. Let everybody uh, grab their seats. Thanks, Kenan. It's an honor to be here to introduce Frank Wilderson. Frank Wilderson III is an award-winning writer, poet, scholar, activist, and filmmaker whose articulation of Afro-pessimism makes him a more than appropriate keynote speaker for a conference on the big no. Dr. Wilderson spent five years in South Africa as an elected official in the African National Congress during the country's transition from apartheid. He also lectured at the University of Vitrasan, sorry for the pronunciation, Vista University and Kanya College, which is a tertiary li level liberation school for activist youth whose studies had been interrupted by the revolution. Dr. Wilderson served as a market theater dramaturge and worked on an all-black South African cast production of the black American play The Colored Museum and as an elected official in the ANC-aligned Congress of South African Writers. Frank Wilderson's received many writing awards, including the Eisner Prize for Creative Achievement of the Highest Order, the Crothers Short Story Award, the Judith Stronach Award for Poetry, the Jerome Foundation Artists and Writers Award, the Loft McKnight Award for Best Prose in the State of Minnesota, the Maya Angelou Award for Best Fiction Portraying the Black Experience in America. Wilderson's books include Incognito, a memoir of exile and apartheid, which was the winner of the 2008 American Book Award, and Red, White, and Black, Cinema and the Structure of U.S. Antagonisms, published by Duke in 2010. Novelist Ishmael Reed called Incognito, quote, an important contribution to the African and American, African American canons and a rare American work that bridges two cultures, black American and black South African. Jared Sexton writes that, quote, Frank B. Wilderson theorizes the singularity of anti-blackness as he refines our understanding of how political economy, popular culture, and the law are shot through with identification and desire, pleasure and pain, sexuality and aggression. Anti-blackness, which is carefully distinguished here from white supremacy, is not only an ideology and an institutional practice, it's also a structure of feeling with pervasive effects. This last crucial point is glossed over by too many authors in their haste to provide rational analyses and challenges to racism, unquote. So as you can see, Frank Wilderson's been busy saying no in a lot of places around the world, in a lot of genre and media, and I'm thrilled to have him here today at UWM. being heard okay? okay? Well, thank you for that very, very generous introduction. And special thanks to Ken and Cal and the whole center for arranging this and inviting me and doing all the, as Ken said, logistics of getting us, getting us out here. I also like to thank my wife, Anita Wilkins, whose intellectual labors have been a great help to me as I develop my own particular interventions in Afro-pessimism. And a very special thanks to, um, I can't name them all, but, but uh, graduate students that I, that I work with whose um, names you should be hearing from in the next not too distant future. Uh, Sally Terefe, uh, Patrice Douglas, uh, Nick Brady, John Murillo, uh, Matthew Chap Chapman, and um, Jay Austin Williams, some of whom have books coming out in the next uh, two years which have uh, taken the theories and the things that I'm going to be saying today to places where, that I could not ever have uh, imagined. So look out for those names. But a really special thanks goes to uh, Jared Sexton, uh, because it was Jared Sexton 
who back in something like 1997, when I was um, a diehard a Gramscian, Negrian uh, naysayer, said to me, uh, perhaps we should be thinking the essential antagonism through, as um, you read in your introduction, the various machinations of libidinal economy and anti-blackness essentially, and, um, and that set us all off on a path that, um, of rereading and rethinking that I think has been very fruitful. I'd like to begin uh, what I have to say today with a, um, <clears throat> a vignette. Excuse me. A vignette from my memoir, Incognito, a memoir of exile and apartheid. And this uh, takes place in, uh, this little scene takes place in 1970. I was 14 years old and basically following my mother and my father around the country, or I had no other choice, I mean, at that age. <laughs> um, but uh, they were, my dad was doing many different uh, sabbaticals and visiting professorships, and th those are back, that was back in the days that I cannot even imagine existed, where you could do uh, several one-year sabbaticals, where at the University of California, they parcel it out to at quarters, so. Um, and my mother was in graduate school. What had happened was that uh, we were going to various cities, Seattle, Detroit, Chicago, and then finally uh, Berkeley over a period of, of not, not contiguous, but about 18 months, almost two years, to in between 68 and 70. And whenever we would go to a place, uh, when we were about to arrive, there would be this promise of a kind of welcome wagon for the various people in the, in the psychology department of wherever we were going to be. And then uh, all that goodwill would dry up as soon as we got there. And so uh, my parents really didn't know what had happened and, and why they got the cold shoulder. And they kept saying that, you know, this is a tumultuous time, 68 to 70. And uh, as my mom said, you've got to give white folks time uh, to come around. So this takes place a sort of coming around in uh, May of 1970 in Berkeley. Halfway through our time at Berkeley, the Kent State murders did make some folks come around. After Kent State, one of Dad's Berkeley colleagues must have thought, it's happening to us the way it's happening to them. Compelled as he was by what was being called in those days the niggerization of the white youth, though seemingly unfamiliar with the heretofore niggerization of niggers, he approached Dad and apologized. One never really knows which is more severe, the blithe disregard one suffers at the hands of white Americans, or the pious remorse through which they purify themselves. It was late in the day and the halls were silent, not even the echo of dust. There were no students in the halls. Some were preparing for vigils and candlelight marches. Some were in the streets throwing stones. Some were in the basements making bombs. Dad passed the open door, unsure as to whether, as whether to speak or walk quietly by. The dilemma was solved when the white colleague's voice called out to my father, asking him to come and sit down. He told Dad that the killings at Kent State had jolted him as never before. Four of our kids dead, he said. He said it was time for him to break the silence. We've done you and your wife an injustice, he said. He was deeply sorry that our family had been blacklisted by the, by the faculty in Detroit, Chicago, and even here in Berkeley, he said, as one might say, even here in heaven. <laughs> he kept repeating blacklisted in an effort to describe a process no black person had ever had a hand in. Before you arrived, he said, FBI agents interviewed some of the faculty. They wanted to know what we knew about you about any allegations or rumors or rumors of allegations. I don't know, Frank, he said. It was all so confusing. Was there a chance they wanted to know, a chance that you and your wife were using the sabbaticals as a cover to run guns across state lines for the Black Panthers? Or some group like the Panthers? It was all so confusing, he added. It's crazy, I know. I should have told you long ago. My father was stunned. He came home and told my mother. Together they were stunned and afraid for days. Then their shock turned to paranoia, and as they slowly came out of their days, to disbelief. 
Like other young mandarins of the great society, my mother and father had thought of themselves as an American couple, simply moving their, family, their American family from one city to another. They, had not, they would not have characterized their sojourn as crossing state lines like bootleggers, gun runners, or jail bait brides. So bound by the promise of their dream were they that they never looked back to see how the fantasy that they pursued along the yellow line was a different fantasy than the one closing in on them. Was this nation so fickle that it cared not whether it hunted down good Negroes like Frank and Ida Lorraine Wilderson or bad Negroes like the Panthers? Did it make no distinction between the two? Were words such as good and patriotic void of adhesiveness when attached to the Negro? Now with this accusation, this official rumor, they felt like they'd been slapped with a nasty gin shoe. Accepting their status as objects in a world of subjects wasn't what they had bargained for. Transporting guns across state lines? Could they really say that about us, they wondered? Is this our destiny? Willful misrecognition? Callous fungibility? Even after the brutal assassination of Martin Luther King, they had not joined the torment of black power. They had remained loyal Americans. They made it, this made it all the more cruel and ironic. Their loyalty had been scorned without their knowing it. Not until late in the day, in the wake of Kent State murders, in an office of captain's chairs and dust-flecked light falling on unmarked papers, did someone tell my father what he'd gone to school all his life to unlearn, that while a nation's destiny is often uncertain, a nigger's destiny is an oxymoron. Now what is striking to me about this vignette is the ease with which the concrete reality of black people is rendered in metaphoric terms. I'm thinking specifically about the professor who confesses to my father. This metaphoric appropriation of social death as a means of coming to grips with the violence of social life is the result of a special kind of imaginative labor one in which blackness functions as a spectacle for the production of optimism or pessimism with respect to the structural oppression of all sorts of people who are not black. We see, in this, we see this in immigration discourse. Muslims are the new niggers, and it was the catalyst for the confessional solidarity, which I mean that by that sarcastically, of the professor who called my father into his office and told him the story of the FBI. Kent State was the real cathexis of his empathy. My father and mother were just the niggers, the empty signifiers that vehiculated an essential emotional investment in non-black people. Empathy is a kind of violence, identification based upon the projection of oneself into the suffering of another. This is clear from the research of a wide range of psychoanalytic thinkers. I'm not disputing this, nor am I suggesting that there is an empathic paradigm that operates schematically through strategies which do not facilitate identification by way of projection and ultimately captation of the other. What I am saying is that the modality of reciprocity is embedded in this transaction. And it is this modality, reciprocity, which can give reciprocity its, its ethical dimension Sorry, which give empathy its ethical dimension. Blacks, however, are structurally barred from the modality of reciprocity. This is the argument. And it is this injunction, which is instantiated ab initio, which is to say from the beginning, that is the problem. The slave is an instrument and an imp implement of empathy, not an agent of empathy. Why is this the case? Why is it the case that the encounter between my father and his colleague, and by extension, my mother and my father's colleague, and if we were, were to be precise in our language, we have, have to rephrase the question, why is, the, is it that the encounter between my father and his master cannot be reversed? There is one word which is the answer, and that word is violence. The structure of violence that elaborates and positions the black is ontologically irreconcilable with the structure of violence that subjugates the human subaltern. To illustrate what I mean, I offer an excerpt from Simon Ortiz's ex uh, epic poem, Sand Creek, 
followed by my poem, Law Abiding. <clears throat> now, juxtaposing these two poems will help us to clarify how the regime of violence that saturates blacks is structurally incompatible with the regime of violence where contingency, where contingency as opposed to saturation, is the operative modality. And how only one regime of violence comes with touchstones of cohesion necessary for redemption. Let's start with Sankri. There should be moments of true terror that would make men think and that would cause women to ho grab hold of children, loving them and saving them for the generations who would enjoy the rain. Who are these farmers? Who are these welders? Who are these scientists? Who are those soldiers with cold, flashing brilliance and knives? Who struck aside the sacred dawn and was not ashamed before the natural sun and dew? Artistically, they splattered blood along their mad progress. They claimed the earth and stole hearts and tongues from buffalo and men, the skilled butchers, aerospace engineers, physicists they became. The future should hold them secret, hidden, and profound. <clears throat> so Law Abiding is a poem I, I wrote uh, in the wake of Oscar Grant's murder uh, by um, the Park Bay Area Rapid Transit uh, Police um, uh, in Oakland, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, Law Abiding. Don't slant the story to fit your needs. Bullets been catching hell from niggas as long as I've been born. Like apples, okay, you got your few bad bullets, but most work hard and vote. Yes, they vote. And got wives and sweet kids in the clip. Who cradles them when a nigga vamps? Who says what to them? This bullet, I have some bad news. Then what? It's about your husband, Mr. John Frederick Bullet, or may I call you Frida? Frida, jo Frida John Frederick passed this evening. Now Frida be strong. For unsavory are the details, he died in a nigger's spine. Crushed on impact, now Frida don't cry. The DA is on it, the judge has been brief, and your husband's friends are in the streets. At first blush, one might be seduced into emphasizing what the poems have in common. The ravages of structural violence on two oppressed populations of color. But another look reveals that the two poems are actually symptomatic of the fact that the violence against Native Americans is not analogous to the violence by which blacks are elaborated in position. The violence of social death, that violence which elaborates and reproduces the slave, is fundamentally different from the violence that usurps Native American land and attempts to destroy the Indian's cultural and territorial sovereignty. The imaginative labor of these poems is symptomatic of this difference. In the first section of Sand Creek, the poem establishes the filial integrity of the people who are being massacred, men who think and women who grab hold of children, loving them and saving them for the generations who would enjoy the raid. So what we have is an intuition on the part of the poet that even though the people being killed are seen as a degraded form of humanity, their humanity is fundamentally acknowledged and in addition, there's a symbiosis, a kind of cruel interdependence between the genocided victims in the opening part of the poem and the descendants of those committing the genocide, skilled butchers, aerospace engineers, physicists. In other words, the relational status of both the Indian victims and the white oppressors is established. A reciprocal dynamic is acknowledged between degraded humanity, Indians, and exalted humanity, white settlers. This reciprocal dynamic is based on the fact that even though one group is massacring the other, both exist within the same paradigm of recognition and incorporation. Their relation is based on a mutual recognition of sovereignty. At every scale of abstraction, the body, family, community, cosmology, physical terrain, Native American sovereignty is recognized and incorporated into the consciousness of both Indians and the settlers who destroyed them. The poem's coherence is sustained by, the, by structural capacity for reciprocity between the genociders and the genocided. This structural reciprocity gives the poem a vision of hope amid the violence manifested in a sense of spatial presence, images of land and weather, and in Ortiz's sense that for both groups, a future is possible. 
This means the violence the Indians suffer has a utility, confiscation and occupation of land that makes it legible and coherent. Law abiding, on the other hand, is predicated on the absence of reciprocity, the absence of utility, and the absence of the kind of contingency that Ortiz's poem takes for granted. Absence, that is, of humanity. In fact, the poem suggests that a family of murdering inanimate bullets could have its grief and loss processed as grief and loss more readily than a family of a black murder victim. Law-abiding does not assume that the touchstones of cohesion which make filiation legible will or can be extended to blacks. There is in this poem no mutual futurity into which blacks and others will find themselves. The future belongs to the bullet. Filiation belongs to the bullet. Our carrying energies will be reserved not for the black but for the bullet. Reciprocity is not a constituent element of the struggle between beings who are socially dead and those who are socially alive, the struggle that is between blacks and the world. We need to comprehend the profound and irreconcilable difference between white supremacy on one hand, which is that being the colonial utility, for example, of the Sand Creek Massacre, and anti-blackness the human race's necessity for violence against black people. The antagonism between the post-colonial subject and the settler, be it the Sand Creek Massacre or the Palestinian Nakba, cannot and should not be analogized with the violence of social death, that is the violence of slavery which did not end in 1865 because slavery did not end then. Slavery is a relational dynamic, not an event and certainly not a place in space like the South just as colonialism is a relational dynamic. And that relational dynamic can continue to exist once the settler has left the colonial territory and even ceded government power. Now these two relations are secured, uh, colonialism and slavery, are secured by radically different structures of violence. Afro-pessimism offers an analytic lens that labors as a corrective to humanist assumptive logic. It provides a theoretical apparatus that allows black people to not have to be burdened by the ruse of analogy, because analogy mystifies rather than clarifies black suffering. Analogy, Afro-pessimism labors to throw this mystification into relief without fear of the fault lines and fissures that emerge in the process. There is a compulsive and repetitive failure in the poem titled, titled Law Abiding. As though in writing the poem, I unconsciously realized the futility of asserting something within blackness, as Ronald Judy writes, that is prior to the devastation that defines it. And the force of the repetition compulsion with which the, for, the poem royals within is vertiginous. The DA's on it, the judge has been briefed, and your husband's friends are in the streets. The poem contains no lines, no fragments, which can be cobbled together with enough muscle to check this devastation, to act on it in a contrapuntal way. This is not the case of the compulsion to repeat, which Freud describes in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, whereby the repetition is something that seems more elementary, more instinctual than the pleasure principle which it overrides. Law abiding, on the other hand, contains no political strategy or therapeutic agency through which the, the violence which engulfs black flesh can be separated from the poem's compulsion to repeat that violence. In a normal situation, that is to say, if law abiding was a poem about subaltern human trauma and genocide, therapeutic and or political intervention could be made to, in the case of therapy, for example, help the poet become aware of a distinction between the violence he may indeed encounter from the state and a range of psychic alternatives to letting that violence consume his unconscious. And in the case of politics, the vision elaborated by a political movement could help the poet imagine a new day and thus imbue state violence with a temporal finitude, such as in the line, our day will come from the Irish Republican army, or, and it did come, or in the dream of the return of the restoration of Turtle Island in Native American theory. This would be true even if the poet did not live to experience that finitude. 
But recourse to political and therapeutic resources presumes a potential for separating schemes of unconscious compulsion, that is the poem's repetitive compulsion, from the violence whose incursions are being compulsively repeated. This presumption only works for human subjects, subjects whose relationship to violence is contingent upon their transgressions. The slave's relationship to, to violence is not contingent. It is gratuitous. It bleeds out beyond the grasp of narration, from the symbolic to the real, where therapy and politics have no purchase. <clears throat> Neither filial conflict to be resolved through therapy, nor a filial conflict to be resolved through politics and insurgent resistance has purchase in the struggle for black redemption. The lines, Mrs. Bullet, I have some bad news, it's about your husband, Mr. John Frederick Bullet, or may I call you Frida, in these lines, the poem seems to realize that the, even the integrity of gender is more properly the possession of an inanimate bullet than of a sentient black being. The violence against black people, which we're witnessing on YouTube videos, Instagrams, and TV news, is conveniently gendered as violence against black men. But there's a problem here, and it is twofold. We tend to lose sight of the fact that black women, children, and LGBT people are losing their breath through the technologies of social death, just as black hetero men are, albeit in less visible and less mediatized ways. We also get drawn into responding to the phobic anxieties of white and non-black civil society, the threat of the black man. And as such, we offer sustenance to that juggernaut, otherwise known as civil society, even as we try to dismantle it. We enhance the pleasurable circulation, that is, of the modern lynching photograph and the snuff videos, which black political organizers have come to depend upon to show the world police violence in an effort to, ironically, redress that violence. And since these images are always, almost always of black males, they shape our agenda in profoundly gendered ways. But there is something also, something else that is problematic here. We come to think of our black oppression as being essentially gendered, as opposed to being gendered in important ways. This, I believe, gives us a false sense of agency, a sense that we can redress the violence of social death in ways which are analogous to the tactics of our so-called allies of color. We want the violence against us to have gendered integrity, in the way that it does when it is levied against the subaltern. So the following um, example from popular culture will illustrate what I'm trying to say here about how the integrity of gender is scandalized when interrogated, interrogated through the interpretive lens of the black, the slave. There's a, um, a cable TV series, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with, it's called uh, Homeland, and, and um, it's ironic that, that uh, it's one of my guilty pleasures. I'm admitting that I actually watched this show. You know, <laughs> all my work is about fuck the police, and here I'm watching a CIA series. You know, <laughs> uh, five seasons in a row. Okay, uh, so be that as it may, <laughs> I'm a, a recovering Catholic, and that's my confession. <laughs> all right, so um, Homeland. It's about the trials and tribulations of a mentally ill, bipolar CIA off officer named Carrie Matheson. In one episode, her cover is that of an investigative journalist who convinces the nephew of an Afghan Taliban leader that she can get him out of Islamabad and help him find safe haven in, in England. <clears throat> I think that's in season four, it's episode called About a Boy. So in, uh, let's see here. So she convinces him that the two of them must stay holed up in a secret apartment for three days as transport is being arranged for his safe passage. It's all a lie. She's really using him as bait to lure his uncle into a trap that she might, so that she might assassinate his uncle. In point of fact, the apartment is really a CIA safe house in which Carrie Matheson holds this young man captive. She then proceeds to seduce him he thinks that they are in the throes of some sort of love affair that is overdetermined by mutual consent. In other words, she doesn't, he doesn't know that he is being raped, repeatedly raped. That is, his consent to this sex 
has been abrogated by the very structure of the conditions in which the sex takes place. It is a rape scenario because the sex that he mistakes for mutual attraction is really a series of multiple acts of aggression in which his consent has been eviscerated completely. The gun the white woman holds to his head needn't be in her hand. In fact, the gun she holds to her head, his head is not one weapon, but the weapons of three million soldiers in uniform and their arsenal of drones and technologies of death. She forces sex upon him through her capacity, the capacity that her white skin embodies. Another way of saying it is to say that white desire is always already weaponized. She forces sex on him through the capacity through that white bodies have to weaponize white desire. The young Afghan man is fucked. He's fucked at every level of abstraction. The guns are in the bedroom, which is to say Carrie Matheson's pistol. The guns are also pointed at his head from outside the street. The CIA operatives who watch the house day and night are armed. The guns are held to his head from high above in the 9,000 drones that saturate the sky and track him as he makes his way back to carry his genuine objective, his uncle, whom she hopes to murder at long range. We have here a pristine example of the ways in which white femininity and white masculinity occupy the same structural position vis-a-vis -a, -vis a man or woman of color. To paraphrase Fanon, the white family is a cutout of the state. Professor Jarrett Sexton puts a finer point on it, on this dynamic. In doing so, he is careful not to include the Afghan young man being raped by the white woman, as I have, but to hone in on the specificity of the black. He writes in, in, this, in his article, um, uh, this article about Eldridge Cleaver's Soul on Ice, uh, he writes, and I quote here, it seems counterintuitive, but because of her, her historical implication in the structures of white supremacy, marked by her limited capacity to marshal state violence or state-sanctioned paramilitary violence, the white woman can have the black man or black woman brutalized for transgressions real or imagined. However, and because of this relation of power, she can also rape him, thereby reversing the polarity of a rape fantasy pervasive in the anti-black world. Regardless of his strength and size, his prowess and his pride, he is structurally vulnerable to her. Contrary to many standard legal definitions, she is able to rape him without his necessarily being physically penetrated against his will. In this sense, the fear of rape and the fear of penetration must be carefully distinguished. Perhaps rape is better understood not as an isolated act, but as part of a spectrum of, sexually, of sexual coercion generated within a broader set of social, political, and economic relations regulated, but not simply controlled, by the racial state and enabling permutations of enactment." End quote. And that's from a uh, 2002 three article called Race, Sexuality, and Political Struggle by Jared Sexton. Now, Sadia Hartman, uh, in her book, uh, Scenes of Subjection. Uh, her diachronic explanation of the paradigm of anti-black sexual violation concurs with Sexton's synchronic explanation of the paradigm. Hartman writes, quote, enslaved men were no less vulnerable to the wanton abuses of their owners, although the extent of their sexual exploitation will probably never be known. And because of the elusiveness or instability of gender in relation to the slave as property and the erotics of terror in the racist imaginary, end quote. So we can see how geopolitical agendas of the white nation cannot be disentangled from the, sex, from the sexuality of white femininity and white masculinity. In other words, white sexuality, as I said before, is always already weaponized. To put it differently, but no less to the point, the United States is the rapist. The rapist that projects the fantasy of its vulnerability onto Muslims, Mexicans, Native Americans, and blacks. 
Fanon discusses the rape fantasy of white women in great detail and in black skin white mask. I won't rehearse it here. For our purposes, we should note that the rapist projects the fantasy of vulnerability by suggesting that she or he is the victim of Islamic jihadism or the victim of black agitation against uh, murderous cops, for example. The, rape, the big bad rapist would have us believe that America is the victim, and underneath that phantasmagoric projection, underneath the fantasy of vulnerability, is a set of assumptions that America is indeed an, an a ethical, social, and political formation. That the problems that America has are not structural, but rather that they are performative, to be found in, in, the, in, the acts, in acts of discrimination or in the use of excessive levels of force. None of this would be a problem if not for the structure of violence that subtends this fantasy. The institutional violence that gives these fantasies what Professor J David Marriott, in his book On Black Men, calls objective value. Sexton gives a concrete explanation of David Marriott's phrase objective value when he says, you better understand white people's fantasies because tomorrow there'll be legislation. That's what the law is. The white fantasy as objective value. The white family and the white state have the firepower and the institutional infrastructure to enforce their projections. What people of color get to do when they go to the polls is decide what flavor of this rape fantasy they are going to support. In the words of George Jackson, an, ele an electoral choice of 10 different fascists is like choosing which way one wants to die. Voting is an important performance, performance of dispossession for people of color who are not black. And there's a distinction here. It's, a, it's an important performance of dispossession for people of color who are not black. But for black people, voting is not just a performance of dispossession. We have to dig deeper and see how the very bedrock, the structure, the very paradigm of electoral politics is predicated on sexualized violence against black people. Sexualized violence against black people is electoral politics condition of possibility. Anti-black violence is the genome of electoral politics. In short, anti-blackness is the genetic material of this organism called the United States of America. The fantasy projections that have been weaponized to rape the young Afghan man would not be possible if the paradigm of the weaponization was not already in place prior to the conflict between Muslims and the US. And that weaponized paradigm is overdetermined by anti-blackness. The US government could, be, could become a democracy for people of color who are, who are not black. It's not likely, but it's entirely possible. But if it ever rid itself of the central ingredient that overdetermines its condition of possibility, that is to say, if the United States of America were to somehow not be anti-black, then we would no longer have a country. It would cease to exist. So I've tried to explain how the US is anti-black anti policy by using a synchronic analysis of um, my father's situation and, and the popular television show. Let me close by pointing out how it is also historically unethical, how the US diachronically is anti-black, uh, to follow up on my recent remarks. In a history book that was published about a year ago, called The American Slave Coast, A History of the Slave Breeding Industry, net by Ned and Constance uh, Sublet. A small portion of this book focuses on the Electoral College. The Electoral College is a prime example of the so-called democratic institution that owes its condition of possibility to the sexualized violence against and the captivity of black people. Without the sexualized violence against and mass incarceration of hundreds of thousands of black captives, America would not be able to elect a US president. Thomas Jefferson would never have become president. In the late 18th century, early 19th century, 389,000, that's less than half a million, 389,000 African slaves were bred by horses and sheep and became four million enslaved Africans in less than two generations. The forced mating of slaves gave the slave states who were, who were breeding slaves 
more voting power over the slave states, <coughs> reported slaves, gave the slave states more breeding power based on the number of slaves that they held. Virginia was the largest slave breeding state. As a result, it gained 25% of the 46 electoral college votes, more than enough to send Jefferson to the White House. So let's stop to think about that for a moment. Slave breeding is a form of captivity that dwarfs the kind of captivity Muslims are subjected to in Guantanamo or in the love nest where the female CIA agent raped the Afghan young man. How else could 389,000 people be forced to procreate under pain of torture or of death into 4 million people if they were not incarcerated and forced into sex? Slave breeding is a kind of forced sex that makes words like rape and incarceration puny and inadequate. The Afghan young man had a prior moment of freedom and a prior space of consent before the white woman held him captive and raped him. For blacks, there is no prior space and time of freedom and consent. The freedom of all others in the form of, elector of electoral politics owes its condition of policy to the unfreedom, the lack of consent, and sexualized violence against black people. People of color experience this madness from time to time, but the forced procreation of blackness is the bedrock of institutionality writ large. The young Afghan man's rights were violated by the white woman, but the concept of rights that can be violated or respected rises up out of the breeding of blacks like cattle. You can, you can speak of prisoners' rights, but the term slave rights is an oxymoron. A diachronic analysis of the Electoral College, much like a synchronic analysis of the vignette from Berkeley or the TV show Homeland, illustrates how black people are political currency, not political subjects. And that is the paradigm of our black people's existence today. Black people are political currency or objects, not political actors or subjects. Subjects have homes, or at least the capacity of some sort of sanctuary. Objects exist as implements in the psychic dwelling of subjects. Thank you. It's Q and A or intervention time. <laughs> right, Woody Allen says, "Can I go now?" <laughs> oh yes, I'm back there. Um, I really the talk. Um, can you talk about this trust in the beginning? And I'm wondering, it's just a question for clarification. Are we thinking of reciprocity between with reciprocity with the other? So blacks are already constituted as the other, um, or or blacks are not even the other in the sense that it, because reciprocity is always with the other, supposedly, yes. right? and that creates the bond and the yeah. anthropological. So how is the blackness constituted? where you say there is no reciprocity even possible. Yeah, well, that, that um, uh, for $24 is my first book out there. <laughs> uh, it, that's, a, that's a really good question, and, and uh, I, I'm going to try and make it simple without being sim simplistic, because it takes, it takes a while to, to, un to unpack. So rather than uh, support the argument, let me just state the claims, which would be very bad writing. But, um, so this, this is, at, the, the crux of your question goes to uh, the heart of a, of a debate, which I think is very productive uh, in black studies, but I don't want to just say in black studies because I think, that, because I think that meditation on capacities through blackness implicate the humanities writ large. Because it, the, the question then becomes, what at a metacritical level is subjectivity? And um, so, very quickly and simply, there's you know there's just something that this is based upon as 
as a condition of belief, uh, which is that words like Africa and black cannot be disimbricated from, um, generally speaking, Orlando Patterson's schematization of, of, of social debt. And that's not a, necessarily a widely held uh, set of assumptions, uh, but the question then becomes, is blackness a position, a paradigmatic position, like the worker, or is it uh, a cultural identity, in, in, you know, like different kinds of workers inside the paradigm of capitalism? And so, um, <coughs> what um, Patterson argues at a kind of macro level is that it takes an ocean of violence to set up a paradigm. You, you have to, it, you know, to, to, to over 200 years or whatever that, that takes to set up a paradigm of capital, so that you now have two new positions, capitalist and, and worker, you need a tremendous amount of violence to, to make that a paradigmatic reality, as opposed to uh, a kind of situational dynamic in one part of the globe. But once that paradigmatic reality has been set up so that the, the category itself sticks, the two categories stick, then the, the violence necessary to produce the, pa the, the, the paradigm goes into remission. And it rears its head when the paradigm, when, when, the, when consent to the categories is being threatened, whether it's a revolution in Cuba or a general strike. Okay, and so, and Gramsci has written at length about this in, in, in the prison notebooks. Um, now, what Patterson says is, yeah, that's true, but, the, but, the, the, but slavery should be thought of as a paradigm in and of itself, not as a set of technologies within capitalism, which is not to say that these paradigms are not interconnected, but it is to say that, you know, which, which paradigm, if it were to be bust open, would put us on the brink of an epistemological break, and which would put us on the brink of a kind of crisis, which is catastrophe and which is crisis. And so, what, 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 uh, which, are, which it should be what a revolutionary is thinking, right? You're always trying to go to that point where the catastrophe ends institutionality as, as capacity as opposed to changes within institutional structure. And so, what, what he argues um, is that. The paradigm of slavery is set up with a kind of violence that is as seemingly as gratuitous as that of capital, but with one caveat. When it is instantiated, it is not going to remission, which is to say that hegemony as a constituent element of the paradigm never becomes operative within the slave estate in the way that it does within capital. Whether you whether you you know whether you're a Gramscian and, and you believe that the that the the violence, you know, Resemerges when there are, are crises in hegemony, or whether, like you know, if I understand Michael Hart and every well, or, or Alan Feldman in his book on on, on, on um, Ireland, you think that we're beyond we're beyond hegemony. There's still temporality there, right? And temporality with respect to the way violence is manifest structurally and the way it performs. And what Patterson is saying is that. Um, the violence of the slave state is what he calls pre-logical, so that it operates in the same manner once it is set up as it did when it was being set up. And this is, this is for me, very generative. Uh, it's, and it's only half the answer to your question, but for, a little footnote why it's generative for me, because I think the conundrum of, of black political organizing is being feeling that one must find a, a rational reason for anti-black police violence, for example, as opposed to thinking it, of it as being homologous with the violence, anti-black violence in movies, or homologous with, with anti-black violence of lynching, that it's a, it's a psychic ritual for the renewal of human presence as opposed to having a kind of essential utility, which would be, say, the extraction of surplus value or the occupation of land. So that so that this violence needs to be repeated, not because it does something tangible, but because it, it, it provides a kind of uh, emotional well-being for the rest of the world. And that then if if, if that if Patterson's right, right, if if the if the if the 
paradigmatic violence of a slave estate cannot be reconciled with the paradigmatic violence of, of, of capital, then we have at a, at a kind of macro level non-reciprocity. But then he ratchets the scale of abstraction down a bit further by, by saying that, you know, uh, trying to make a corrective to the analysis of slavery that has happened up to 1982 by, by saying, you know, in a nutshell, that people who have been writing about slavery up to 1982 have been actually mistaking experience and events for a definition, which would be the same like if your third grade teacher asked you to define a word and you told her a story, you gave her an anecdote. So it's not a definition. So he says, here is the definition. What is the, what is the relational dynamic of capital, of, of, of social death, slavery? And he says, relational dynamic is the absence of a relational dynamic. Um, and, and it has nothing to do with that part of the psychic topography, the pre-conscious or the unconscious, which would be used to say, what does the slave think about him or herself, but everything to do with structural position. That aspect of your being that exceeds and anticipates you, that is your place in the world that is waiting for you. And, and, and the three elements for him are uh, general dishonor, which is to say that one is dishonored in one's being. So one does not have the opportunity to be honorable or dishonorable and natal alienation, which is the absence of the outside world's recognition and incorporation of your ideas of affiliation. You may say you have a grandmother, a grandfather, children, husband, wife, but the world doesn't recognize you as a relational being at the level of affiliation. And what we've been doing is saying that then expands to the level of affiliation, which is other institution, institutional um, presences that you actually decide upon yourself, you cannot be recognized as a, a subject in theirs. And so that's what I would mean by non-reciprocity. I think there's one here and then one there. One, two. Um, yeah, I see you. I think you're very popular. Um, I, I see you um, engaging with uh, Jacques Derrida and Jacques Derrida. Yeah. Um, and I think you have a specifically the article Besides the one you mentioned on unbearable blackness, mm -hmm. in which he talks about um, this notion of like the cradle to the grave, and, yeah. and the notion of the cradle to the grave, and yes. uh, the and the uh, notion of anti-abortion and uh, blackness in the womb. And so I'm wondering if so in amalgamation schemes he talks about how multiracialism is, is more and more interpreted in terms of whiteness, and it it um, disavows the uh, the rape of black women. And so I wonder if part of what you're talking about as a constituent violence is that this rape is already predicated on a world level. And yeah. The, the, the actually the birth of more and more black children is this notion of cradle to the rape. Kind of. But it's predicated on this white rape of black women that it's about. Yes. I mean, <laughs> you said it all. <laughs> I, said, I, I mean, I trying to connect the yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that's a that is. I mean, as I said before, it was my going through grad school with Jared and and um, him kind of punctuating our discussions with with this has really um, changed my thinking on on, on things. Um, and so. Yes, I, I, as a comment you made, I'm in full agreement with it. I don't know if you want me to say something, answer it. I maybe also, is there like a, I, I feel like a lot of black feminist work is more trying to um, elaborate a, uh, an ethics or a kinship out of this racket. It, it, it seems to me like it's um, the primal scene, if there's a primal scene, would be the plantation. Uh -huh. And I wonder if there's a possible engagement with black feminist work. Um, you foresee, or like, um, oh. Yeah, I, th I think that uh, redemption. Redemption. Yeah. In maybe, what way? Maybe too strong, or more of an engagement. Yes, <laughs> most most definitely. I, I I don't think that the connections for, for me. I can only speak personally. I mean, I could not have. I mean, Sexton made these comments when we're in school. You know, let's 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 think paradigmatic. Let's think anti-blackness paradigmatically. We've been thinking of it performatively. Um, but it really, it doesn't really click with me um, completely Joe until he actually introduced me to Sidia Hartman, who was, who was on campus at, at that time. And uh, 
I sat down with her in the interviews in uh, Journal Kaf Kippur, 2000, that we, that we did. And you, one of the things that I realized, uh, and this is what the vignette about my father was so important to me, that as, I, as I realized um, how much of a camouflage job she had to do just to stay alive. In other words, if she were to actually write a book, when she said to me, this book takes place in the 19th century, but it's really an allegory of the present. And I was like, aha. What's really interesting is that one of the, one of the points that she's, that she's making, which I think resonates with your comments in, the, uh, in her chapter on seduction, is how the court doesn't recognize a violation of consent in rape cases against uh, black slave women. But if you think of it as an allegory of the present, then it's, then it's that preconscious, we don't recognize a violation of consent because you had no consent to be violated. And what, what Hartman would, would have wanted to say, uh, but is the coerced nature of the academy, was that that very clear, direct refusal of the slave woman's consent of the 19th century has actually been um, gone underground into the libidinal economy and still plays out today. So the court doesn't say you have no consent, but the faith-based institution of the unconscious still plays that out that way, and it is the fantasy of the, of the unconscious which actually um, subtends the violence of the court. So in a way, it might be worse in the 19th century because it's not spoken, but more firmly instantiated in law. Put your hand over here. Yeah. And then one in the back. Well, I really appreciated your juxtaposition of Thomas Jefferson with the American and in, in the Middle East recently. And it reminded me of, of this of anecdote that happened to me in class where I was one of only a few black people in the class. And I was, I was basically made to stand in for a North African Barbary pirate um, in, this, in this kind of explanation of why it was, why, uh, why an American ship would be justified on firing upon a pirate even if they didn't get the consent from the Thomas Jefferson administration. Um, and then this was used as an example to justify standard ground laws. And so it got me thinking about, um, is there a way in which, if we think about Thomas Jefferson's uh, engagement with the North African Barbary pirates during his presidency, does that, what does that do to how we think about the relationship between anti-blackness and, histor um, and historical anti-blackness in the US and our current, uh, America's current involvements in the Middle East now? What do you think? I'd be interested. In so, I don't know. I've been trying to wrap my head around it since it happened. Yeah, I haven't thought about that. I, I, I'd like to have a nice, pithy answer for you. I, I, but what I find really fascinating is, is your place in all this, you know, in, in that you were made to... How did that happen? I'm just curious. <laughs> um, I, was, I was TAing the class. Uh, there was one of the few, there are a few black students in the class. And it was one of, it was maybe the second day of the class, and it was kind of my introduction to the class, uh -huh. was as this stand-in for this Barbary, Barbary Pirate. We had just read about the Barbary Pirates earlier in the week. And I don't know, it was one of those things that just... I mean, did the class ask you to do that, or did the, uh, the professor? You, you, uh, yeah, <laughs> the boss. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I. I mean, for me, this is just standing here at the podium. This is where my mind is is going as as you know, for the impressionistic heat of the encounter, uh, because there you are, available as an implement for this story without your permission. Yeah. Thank you. In the back. And then, was there one over here too? Okay, one, two. Uh, yes, thank you for your talk. So, um, the way I wanted to frame my, my question, especially you know, grounding this idea of a, a paradigmatic you know, analysis, yeah. is you know, I wonder if one way, one distinction we can make between black people and black life. Because it seems as if you know, part of what you're trying to do is saying, saying that you know, if, if we keep focusing on your, um, let's say, individual black people's experiences, you know, can we get justice for this you know, person who murdered you? Know, can we depend on the law? So, you know, I'm wondering if what you introduce actually changes, um, change what it means that you from political discourse. Mm -hmm. Our political discourse often boils down to what saves the black people in prison, 
let's stop you know, having them be killed, let's get them out of those neighborhoods. But you seem to be saying, and you know, I, this is not a critique, I just want to like, you know, put out there what like, seems to be really radical what you're saying, is that you know, that comes up with a fundamental problem, it is that insofar as we no longer avow that black life is constituent of this system as black death. Yeah. So that even when you try to save black people, we don't do the problem that black life is still considered an impossibility. So the question I want to put to you is that considering our political rationality, the way that we talk about these things, is often geared around legislation. And you know, um, legislation, um, what's the word, the solidarity mm -hmm. and all of that. You know, how do you really disrupt them when you start bringing in the language of fantasy and unconscious? Because I can see when you're doing this, and I see that as you lay out, but you know, no one's going to actually avow that those anti-black fantasies are there. So is, is the analysis that you give, um, do you give a productive mode of um, engagement, or do you show that as long as you're talking and avoiding the fans that no one wants to talk about, it, I'm surprised you um, actually gesture towards you know, those moments in black scene like mass that which get the on the most trouble when he talks about the great fantasy and all of that because you know I think maybe that often gets very misinterpreted. Yeah. Are you calling for a completely different type of language of what it means to resist or engage in revolution, that the revolution can't just be conscious, but also has to be unconscious? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because because I think I think that that um, I and I, and I don't have a prescription for for that. I mean, what what I think is that coalition spaces are about what they say they're about, but they're also just like the police. They're about the management of black anger. So. Um, Yeah, please do, please do. Um, so would you, could you also say with this idea of you know, black life, you know, um, being constitutive? And I heard you kind of say this in some of your examples that, you know, the problem of black life doesn't just affect people whose skin looks black. That it can actually start to spread to other people. I think that's what you're getting with your homeland example. Well, no, no in the homeland example, I, I, so, yeah, I, in, the, in 45 minutes I couldn't, thank you for that, just make it like this. It had to be an accordion like this. But what I was trying to say is that is that we actually need really careful, like tweezer-like analysis of the difference between white supremacy and anti-blackness, and and part of the tweezer-like analysis would would help us understand um, the difference between uh, loss and absence, um, the difference between say dishonor and an and objection, which is which is to say that there is a narrative temporality to what is happening to that Afghan young man. Just like there's a narrative temporality to, to um, the dispossession of, of Native Americans. But social death is, the, is, is not an, an aporia within, narrative, within a particular narrative. It is, the, it is an aporia of the logic or the ontology of narrative itself. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is, there, is, there, is that in, in any kind of multi- racial coalition, there are not a bunch of people who suffer white supremacy. There are actually two layers. There are the, all the people who suffer white supremacy, and then there are the blacks who suffer anti-blackness from the coalition partners and from the, and from the state. And, and that, that is at the level of, 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 of the ways in which, not solely, but most importantly, the ways in which the unconscious uh, can be manifest as what merit calls objective value by others against blacks, by whites against non-blacks, and by non-blacks against blacks, but not by blacks against any others. And that gets back to the other point about reciprocity. And the only way that I can get to that, you know, the people I named at the beginning also, is by rethinking blackness, not totality, but the truth of it as slaveness, as opposed to thinking of it in more cultural uh, manifestations, as a as a as a position. So, I, for example, if we just take it away from, if, you know, I would one would never say that life in a sweatshop on the other side of the Rio Grande, as the same experientially as life working as a Swedish professor in Stockholm, right? The level of, of they don't, they, but 
both are, are, um, are approached by the command modalities of capital in the same structural way, the wage and the, and the commodity. So what I'm really interested in, if, for example, if you're take, talking about chess, one way would be to write about a chess game and a chess match. Another way would be to write about um, the capacities of the positions, the nature of the board, and the dispensation of, of, of power, regardless of what game is played. And I think that's really important here. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I think that that's, you're, abs you're absolutely right there. Uh, you know, I was at a, um, a conference uh, years ago, and at the end of the day, um, it was it was about race, and so and race then becomes an imprecise way of think, talking about blackness, given what you're saying and what I've been trying to say here. But for the sake of argument, we're all together. At the end of the conference, the organizer said everyone is to break into uh, breakaway rooms for 90 minutes, uh, based upon the way you are perceived by the police on visual contact. You know. Um, yellow, brown, red, black, you know. And what was really interesting was the, was whenever, whenever, you know, I've written in the book Red, White, and Black, that when blacks are in the room, the room can't use the personal pronoun we, because there are two, as phenomena say, two different species in the room. And that was not a, in anyone's mind at that conference, okay? But what happened was that the affect showed was symptomatic of that announcement. The affect was symptomatic of the structural antagonism, which is not to say how people wanted to be with each other or how they loved or how they related. Um, your position exceeds and anticipates you. It doesn't ask you, would you like to be here? Okay, and the position needs theorizing. And so uh, the blacks were at the back of the room. Like, yes, finally, we're done with all this culture shit, you know? We can get on to you know, structural violence. Everyone else was at the front of the room yelling at the organizers. I'm not yellow. I'm, I'm from South Korea. I'm, I'm uh, Filipino, Filipino, you know, uh, different forms of, of, of uh, Latinos. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, what was really fascinating to me was the organizers weren't feeling it at all. They said, no, 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 no. This is an exercise in how you're perceived paradigmatically. It's not an exercise about what you think about yourself at the level of identity. You know, and so they were not giving in to anybody. But then a group of people moved to the front. And what was really kind of funny in a morbid sense is that uh, they said, you know, we're half black and half white, and so we want our own room. So they made an argument based upon biology, genetics, uh, you know, I have one father who's black, a mother who's white. Uh, but the actual, their actual embodiment and, and the, the performance was very much hyperbolically black, like getting butt, you know, we're gonna do, you know. And so the organizers took that in, and, they, and, the, and the, the terror was such that they didn't feel towards the other people who were saying, we have these cultural identities, that they let them go <laughs> to their own biracial room and talk about police aggression. Okay, so now we're in the room, and the first thing that we do in, in the black room is, because one of the, one of the, one of the, sh the things on the sheet was, when you finish talking about this, come back to plenary and, and tell us how, you're, um, how, we, how we can help as different coalition partners within this multicolored rainbow, right? And so the first thing we did was is to tear up the sheet. We just said no to the question. Pissed off by what had just happened, you know? And what was really interesting to me, um, and Sadia Hartman, had, this was before 2002, she had not given us the word Afro-pessimism uh, yet, so we were just thinking about these things. And what was interesting to me was the way in which, as, as uh, Lacan says, there's no time in the unconscious. People were talking about microaggressions on their job using the um, episodes from slavery as though they were intertwined. There, were, there was not... People were so not having to relate to other non-black people that the, the conversation was flowing and no one said, wait a minute, that happened on a plantation. It's just, you know, you're talking about your, your job at the office. You know, no one's, so, okay, we're an hour into it, we got 30 minutes left, and there's this knock at the door. We opened it up. It's the biracial people. And we're standing there. And so most people got their ass on their shoulders, right? What the fuck you want, right? That kind of thing, right? <laughs> and so... Uh, they said, what had happened is they had run out of stuff to talk about. 
because they're basically talking about stuff about their individual lives, how they relate to one parent, how they don't feel comfortable with this space or that space, and oh, just, just, and and when it when they finally came around to what the exercise was, they had to actually talk about themselves as black, and so. Um, they said, can we join your group? And fortunately, you know, I mean, I should say that most people are not like alive to this, you know, having been rejected, because this is, this is the point that Sexton is making in Amalgamation Schemes. He's saying that to imagine oneself as biracial, you've got to make a series of moves, either consciously or unconsciously, that are anti-black which is the same kind of moves, I mean, he's not the first to say this. Fanon says this uh, about Jean Venus in The Man of Color and the White Woman. He says this about Maya Capetia, that she, she develops her sense of, of value when she finds out she has a white grandmother in Canada. And, and so, but she, to make that narrative clear to herself, she's got to distinguish herself from women who are seen as pure African. That's a move made in the psyche. Everybody makes this move, right, in one way or another. And so, they're standing there and said, can, 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 can we uh, come in? And fortunately, I had read some of this Sexton's work in manuscript form, and I said, well, you never left. Because your, your, your place here or your place there has nothing to do with what you think about yourself. You, know, you're, you're, you only get to manage your life in certain ways in your structural constraints, and that's what we're here to talk about. You've, and you've always been here with us. And, if, you know, and Hortense Pillars makes the same point, right? That mulattoness is actually a production of the narrative topography of a white need to divide Africanness for a, a kind of counter-insurgent narrative move. Did that answer <laughs> Thank you, that was a really interesting talk. I have a question about um, something you said about um, uh, the conundrum of black political organizing and finding rational reasons for violence against black people. Then you think about Ferguson, and what I've learned since the death of Michael Brown is that there was a lot of value in oppressing black people in Ferguson. Small infractions, ticketing, black, you know, broken windows. All of that is supporting not only Ferguson, but many of the neighboring towns, right? There's, there's, that's a cash industry right there. So the cops are enforcing this way of extracting value out of black lives. So I'm wondering how that economics fits into your assertion that police violence, that there's no explanation police violence. That there's no? I think you said that there's, that there's, there's no reason for violence against black people. It's structural. It's, you know, it's a structuring cause. It seems like in Ferguson there's lots of reasons, which maybe doesn't mean that there aren't structural conditions, but I'm wondering how you reconcile them. So, um, I often get pegged as, a, as an anti-Marxist, uh, and, and it's, it's really not that. It's, it's that um, theory aspires to a kind of generalization. I mean, the, the, the question is how to undo the world. And what I believe is that that's a part of it, an important part, but it's not paradigmatically essential. And why do I not believe it's paradigmatically essential? Uh, because I, because I, the, the extraction of surplus value is vital and important. But what I think is essential and, 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 fund, and fundamental is the imaginative labor that goes into making blackness always already available for that. So that's where I would, that's where I would draw the, this, this distinction. In other words, um, there are other communities, uh, white communities, for example, of high drug use, that um, could be targeted for this type of state financial enhancement, but they're not. Uh, in 1988, uh, the state of California produced a law called the Street Terrorism Enforcement and Protection Act. and. Um, Sociologists might tell you, okay, so the, the, the bedrock of, the, of that act is, is that um, if, um, in the example that of someone who's prosecuted, a, a, a young man uh, was accused of committing a crime uh, in a certain part of LA, away from where he lived. In, he lived in uh, South Central LA somewhere. And uh, he was arrested with three of his friends. It was called gang related, and he went back to his house, they, they found um, a family photo album with uh, photographs of his mother with members of his friends. 
So then she then became a, a, def a defendant in this crime based on her being able to be captured under the crime, even though she was nowhere near that and didn't actually make that physical performance. I think it was, it was accused of, of, of rape. I'm not sure. But the point is she did 18 months. What's interesting to me is that um, the Sacramento legislature um, imagined a sanctuary, a place of domesticity, the house where the boy lived, as a, as a, as a, as a crime scene for, for which the people who are related to him could be captured under his crime, and the house itself, the valuables in the house, uh, can be sold at, at police auction. So what I would say is, is that that's not, that's not um, removed from the extraction of surplus value. It's certainly implicated in it, just like the other laws that, that you mentioned. But what I think is fundamental is the way in which that young man and his mother and their space are continuously fungible and available to the unconscious as for example, a slave cabin, even though they might pay rent there, and that their bodies are implements of the psychic need of someone else. That, that's, in other words, that that fantasy projection can be made and then made law, I think is in service to something beyond the accumulation of profits. It's, a, it's, it's in service to the psychic health of the rest of the world. There's one here. Yes. Um, I guess I'm interested in what a, a potential conversation between your work and Fred Norton's work would look like. Um, specifically, I'm thinking of his critique of Orlando Patterson and social death. That for him, that whole notion is uh, predicated on the idea that the only life is a political life which is not a notion that he buys. And that, that seems to also be um, a, a part of your argument about the, the way in which black people are disqualified from the realm of being political subjects. So yeah, I'm interested in that. I don't want to argue with Fred in public. He's a dear friend. <laughs> uh, and he's a lot smarter than I am. Um, I will just say that, that I'm not... I wouldn't, I, w I personally, I don't think, I don't take um, Patterson's schematization as being just about politics. So that, that would be one thing. I, I, think, I think it's an intervention into the nature of subjectivity, not just the nature of political subjectivity. Uh, because what it's suggesting is that um, subjectivity has capacities but it also needs, you know, in other words, the capacity for, um, to be recognized as a relational being, the capacity to be in that kind of Bactinian mode of, of uncertainty throughout narrative, which, is to, which would be, am I going to be treated honorably or dishonorably? The, the, what what uh, Lewis Gordon calls the difference between um, whether, whether I will be treated honorably or dishonorably, and the condition of the black, which Gordon would call when. When will I be treated dishonorably, not whether. Okay. So I think that I, I take it as, as not just relegated to the realm of politics, but to the question of what the metaphysics of being. That would be one point. Um, the other point is I don't think that, that there's so much difference between what, what people like myself and Sexton are saying, and what Fred is saying. Um, and Fred Moulton himself has said, I'm 49% there. You know. He said 97.5% a few weeks ago. Did he really? All right. <laughs> well, he's 97. OK, well, cool. <laughs> you know. um, and, and so what, it, it, a lot of it has to do with, with when and where you enter also. You know, I mean, um, I entered thinking about what do people mean when they talk about violence? Because I think that's a very under-theorized conception. People are, uh, often don't know the distinction in their own minds between violence that produces paradigms of relations and violence that is performed on the street. Okay? And so that's where I'm trying to locate what I'm, what I'm wondering about. Um, 
But I think that Sexton wrote an article, and I can't reproduce it here, but it's called The Social Life of Social Death, um, which I think is really important. And um, I think it's generous, both to, to, to us and to, and to uh, Fred Moulton. And so just like I was saying to the brother in the back there, you know, this is, this is not the, the total, I'm not talking about the totality of blackness. I'm thinking about the, the truth, just like the, the totality of being a worker is not um, the conditions of a sweatshop or the conditions of a factory um, or the conditions of a professorate in Stockholm. But the truth of the, of the worker is very much um, the truth of every worker is elaborated in Das Kapital. And that's where, you know, in other words, we need an analysis of, of, of the context, of positions, and an analysis of, of their capacity. So that would be my shorthand answer to that. Oh, I'm sorry, way in the back. Yes. Entirely clear myself, um, but I have some impressionistic um, ideas, and s- s- I want to say that some of this comes from the work of, of some of the grad students I, I mentioned also. Because in in uh, my book, uh, Red, White, and Black: Cinema and the Structure of U.S. Antagonisms, and in um, Cynthia Hartman's Scenes of Subjection, we kind of think this this break, this this kind of paradigmatic. Um, moment, if you will, in the, in the middle passage. What I've learned since then, uh, and mainly through uh, graduate students that I've had the honor of working with, is that um, this goes back to 625 AD. And um, it, in other words, that when the Arabs decide that Africa is a place of slaves, that that becomes a consensus, and it, and it becomes a consensus. You know, for undergraduates, I use a comic book, a graphic uh, book called *The Black Holocaust for Beginners*, and by S. E. Anderson. And he doesn't he doesn't make what I'm making out of his own evidence. But what it, one of the things that he's saying is that um, I think because he's he's a historian and not a, a, a critical theorist, but the the information is really important. Uh, and is that you have a situation in which um, first the Arabs moving into the east of Africa from, from long before the Portuguese, I mean 625 moving on up, uh, begin to see Africa as a place where there are not relational beings. And as a result, um, they begin to export slaves. And then he's pointing out that this becomes, a, when I say consensus, I don't mean at the level of a, a Congress of some sort. It's, it spreads like a faith-based institution to Moroccan Jews. Um, they talk about East Indians, Chinese. Uh, one person, I, I, I've had the honor of reading her work talking about how in Iran this takes place and in, 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 in Iraq. So that, in other words, the point is that, th- that there are people, Maasai, Buganda, um, Akakuyu, who were there and who are still there. But they're not black until, in other words, black begins to bubble up through Arab poetry and literature. You have, no, you have more of a friend in the dog than you do in the black, you know, uh, as, a, as a proverb. Um, it, begins to, to, it begins to 
name a position in which myriad identities and cultures are captured, just like worker names one. And that this position then cannot be, you cannot, this is a very controversial bone of contention, but one which I firmly believe. This naming cannot be disimbricated from social death. And that means, that's, nor can the word Africa. In other words, that's really important to me um, because in his book, and this is where I part from Orlando Patterson, Slavery and Social Death. In his book, uh, Slavery and Social Death, Orlando Patterson goes back a thousand years and he goes around the globe to all c kinds of communities, from Choctaw Indians prior to contact with um, Columbus to uh, Europeans to uh, a whole dynasty in China in which uh, the bureaucrats of the civil service were actually slaves. And he says that in all these situations, um, chattel is not Chattel is, is an experience of some situations. It's not a defining aspect of slavery, nor is forced labor a defining aspect of slavery. The, aspect, the, the, the constituent elements that define slavery are those elements that I named earlier, which produce an absence of relationality in the midst of relationality. So we have an ensemble of people who, who understand themselves as, as relational beings, but at a meta level, relationality itself can, not, can only be understood because there's this other group of people who, are, who, are, who have been recruited, this is a verb <coughs> that Patterson uses, who have been recruited into social death. So what he's saying is that this is really bad for people who are recruited into social death, but it's really positive because it gives it gives a psychic coherence to community. Now, my point is that he's actually articulating temporality there because there's a, there's a narrative progression, which is equilibrium, that moment in the narrative when the person was a relational being, moving like any other narrative to disequilibrium, that moment when one is recruited into social death, which then holds out the possibility for some form of uh, restoration, whether it's real or imagined, of that equilibrium from which one was dispossessed, which would be manumission. However, what we're arguing in Afro-pessimism is that that narrative progression does not exist for the word black, which then makes it a, a position in a paradigm as opposed to an identity in an experience. It's time. Okay. Please join me in thanking Frank. <laughs>